Welcome to the In My Opinion Show. I am Henry Hatter, your host today. I have with me Robert Garza. Bob, uh, I'm going to call him Bob. Uh, Bob is uh, an educator, a writer, a musician, and just simply a great, good old American. Uh, <clears throat> again, thank you, Robert, for returning to the show again, the In My Opinion Show. We've had some great discussions over the years. Uh, today, uh, we would like to talk about Cinco de Mayo. Mm -hmm. Although Cinco de Mayo does not occur until May, but this is the diversity month in America, I mean in the United States. And we ask you to come on our show to share with us experiences that people have when they celebrate Cinco de Mayo and why that should be important and relevant to our own lives as um, companion Americans, uh, as black Americans, as uh, white Americans, and as Hispanics, mm -hmm. etc. So I'm going to ask you, what does Cinco de Mayo mean? Well, I would like to say thank you very much, Henry, for inviting me to your program. It's always a pleasure to come here and share some information. Uh, first of all, Cinco de Mayo is not Mexico's Independence Day. That's September 16th. So a lot of people confuse it. Cinco de Mayo is May 5th. Uh, Mexico Independence Day is in September. So <clears throat> Cinco de Mayo is a celebration that grew out of an event that happened a long time ago in Mexico in 1862. What happened at that time was that uh, the French army was trying to invade Mexico, and they had a pretty good they had a pretty good chance of doing that because they had a much bigger army, they were more well equipped than the smaller Mexican army that was less equipped and less numbered. So uh, the Mexican army defeated the French, and as as a result of that. People have been celebrating that particular day of May of May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, ever since. Uh, here in the United States, it has become, uh, in a way, uh, more uh, dominant than the actual Independence Day of Mexico in that, that is celebrated in September. So if you go to Mexico, you'll see a much, much bigger celebration of uh, their Independence Day uh, in September rather than in May, Cinco de Mayo. So uh, basically that is what happened in history uh, and how we today in the United States celebrate this, uh, this event by having a fiesta, fiestas all over, uh, all over the country. And as I also understand, other parts of the world also celebrate Cinco de Mayo. You know, <clears throat> Bob, I'm listening to your comments here. And then I'm comparing that to what's going on in the United States and worldwide with respect to uh, undocumented Americans. Mm -hmm. And so far, with your presentation, you have not touched a nerve. And I can't understand why we have this difficulty around the country, and I don't want to dwell mm -hmm. on that. But I want other people to take a look at your approach. It's non-combative and based on uh, not public policy, but it's based on cultural aspects of what Cinco de Mayo brings to cultures mm -hmm. to share in those expenses. Would you like to further explain that? Well, uh to look at uh, perhaps uh, how, how this particular fiesta has grown so huge in the United States, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it comes from looking at different aspects of the culture. So, for example, one of the, one of the most uh, easiest way to try to understand a culture is to, for example, look at their food. Right? We can explore a culture, any culture, by simply exploring the food. And that, uh, to me, that's a great way of doing it, right? So if you have an event, if you have a fiesta of some sort that certain people, groups of people are putting on in your community, whether it be Latino or whether it be German or, or some other fiesta, you can go to it with the idea is that I'm gonna explore the food to try to understand the culture a little bit. 
I'm going to listen to the music. Maybe I'm going to dance a little bit. Right? Maybe I'm going to look at their art. Maybe I'm going to learn more about their history. So uh, that is an excellent way for us to explore other cultures, right? Yes. Excellent way. Right? And it's a way of creating international relationships with Absolutely, other countries yeah. and other people yeah. the, to keep down war mm -hmm. and create areas that are livable and uh, that uh, uh, prevent war and stuff like that mm -hmm. between adjacent well, countries. Yeah, we do that with, uh, for example, uh, St. Patrick's Day in yes. March. You know? a, lot of, a lot of people assume, you know, and, and slide right into that culture. You know, uh, they go to events, they go to celebrations, uh, to celebrate the food, you know, the music, uh, the art, and to participate and interact. That, that's what we need to do, is I, interact with people. My wife and I would go to Saginaw to uh, celebrations, but they were not for Cinco de Mayo. We would go with friends who had a wedding or a mm -hmm. ceremony of mm -hmm. some kind, and we love the Mexican music mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the food and the camaraderie that we've had. Right, it, it, it develops a, a very friendly atmosphere, right, where you feel comfortable, right, versus, you know, taking some other approach to, to learning about a culture. And uh, it, it's, a, it's just an excellent way of doing it, right? In my, celebra in my investigation of uh, Cinco de Mayo from Wiki, I found that there are other countries that celebrate, non-American countries that celebrate Cinco de Mayo. Would you believe that uh, Ireland celebrates it, mm -hmm. Canada and others? Uh, and yet it's uh, far removed from the location of right. Cinco de Mayo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. occurred and would appear to have no relevancy. But somehow, how do you think that relevancy uh, became to exist? Well, uh, when you look at it from the standpoint of, uh, of history, all right, uh, perhaps people really do want to learn more about other ethnic groups. Right? When you look at it through the idea of just having a, a good fiesta, I think that opens the door for many people to explore uh, other people uh, through through those elements of music, art, food, and so forth, dance, and so forth. So, uh, and we also it also brings us into uh, the historical uh, content, and for many uh, people in the United States. They, they tend to forget or perhaps they need to be reminded that uh, that the southwest of the United States, a good portion of that used to belong to Spain. And after that, when Mexico gained, gained its independence, it was then territory of Mexico. So it wasn't until the mid-1800s uh, where, uh, where Mexico lost that territory to the United States in the uh, U.S. Uh, Mex Mexican War, and then they, as a result of winning that war, they gained all that territory for the United States. So, uh, let me ask you. <coughs> speaking of owning the Southwest, mm -hmm. now the Mexicans were very, very powerful people. They were part of the Aztecs heritage. Their heritage. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Now, what we know about the Aztecs, they were very well-developed culturally, uh, militaristically, mm -hmm. art, and all mm -hmm. of that. <clears throat> but uh, looking at Mexico when it was dominant, there was a time it was dominant on this continent, mm -hmm. did they ever have any ambitions to become, to colonialize like the Europeans did? I don't uh, recall any, you know, reading anything that pertained yeah, to no that. Yeah, no ambition. No, I don't. Yeah. I, that that I recall, you know, that reading about that, you know, um, Mexico for a long time uh, went through very, very many presidents and rulers and emperors and dictators, and they had a whole uh, variety of, of rulers in Mexico, and uh, a lot of it was, you know, for them trying to 
to control what was going on around Mexico City, right? And part, part of the reason that uh, Mexico lost its territory to the north because they weren't focused on the territory to the north. They were more focused in central Mexico. Uh, so that, that was part of the reason. Bob, we're going to have to stop right there and take a look at the video. Oh, great. Uh, great. You, mm -hmm. As we go through this, I believe that yeah. uh, after that, you mm -hmm. can come back and explain. It. Sure, absolutely. To begin with, it is not Mexico's Independence Day of September 16th. It is, rather, a historic battle between the invading French army and the Mexican army in Puebla, Mexico in 1862. May 5th is the date in which the Mexican army defeated a much larger and powerful French army. By doing so, Mexico delayed another foreign invasion, but the story does not end. It was only, it was only one of numerous battles in Mexico's long history of achieving independence from European dominance. The primary cause of the French invasion was because Mexico had borrowed money from France, Spain, and England. Mexico was unable to pay back the loan, mainly because of the social reform of 1857 to 1860, known as La Guerra de Reforma. While Spain and England could wait for a payment from Mexico, France would not. So France decided to invade Mexico. People in Mexico remember this date because it represents a part of their liberation from many countries that tried to dominate it. As a result of the victory over the French army, Mexico realized its power. Cinco de Mayo in Mexico In Mexico, Cinco de Mayo is called La Batalla de Puebla. It's here in the United States that the event became better known as Cinco de Mayo. This event is celebrated with parades, concerts, fiestas, folklore dancers, food, art, and other cultural expressions. The event does not have the splendor of Mexico's Independence Day on September 16th. Cinco de Mayo in the U.S. Well, if you remember in the video Son los Países, I mentioned that the Southwest U.S. was once a part of Mexico. Mexicans and Mexican Americans have celebrated cultural events in the Southwest for many years. Cinco de Mayo is celebrated here in the U.S. because it's a reminder for Mexicans and other Latinos, to remember their heritage, ethnicity, and to reaffirm their cultural roots. In regions of the United States with a high Mexican-American population, like the Southwest, Midwest, Chicago, and New York, Cinco de Mayo is very popular. You will also see events here in Michigan and in other states celebrating this event. For many, it's a good opportunity to join in on the celebration and party. Cross-cultural inspiration. 
Just like non-Irish people celebrate St. Patrick's Day in the U.S., Cinco de Mayo has crossed over within other ethnic groups. Again, many join in on this cultural celebration. Non-Latinos find this celebration very inviting, especially with the food, music, art, and other cultural activities. about uh, the videos running now and we can continue to talk. Um, so Mexico had no ambition to expand its territory uh, within the United States after, say, 1848. That was the Mexican War with uh, uh, California, oh no, with Texas. Texas independence, right? Right, right. And that was a war that ceded that Southwest mm -hmm. to the Americans, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, again, uh, to the United States. Right. <clears throat> uh, but uh, prior to that, they just wanted to hang on to the territories that they had and they had no ambition beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another thing that was happening at that time too was the immigration uh, from other parts of the world that were going into uh, what is now Texas, right? So a lot of influences were happening, a lot of dynamics were happening at that time. And uh, as a result, uh, that, that movement continued to grow and grow and grow. Uh, and uh, Mexico was just acting too slow on that. Right? And perhaps it was just, uh, you know, fate or uh, maybe it was just destiny that things uh, changed and turned out that way, but uh, you, that's what do happened. Do you see uh, some regrets from young Mexican-Americans today uh, as a result of uh, uh, the loss of that Southwest to uh, the United States? Mm -hmm. uh, would, so for example, when you see kids who uh, Mexican-Americans at schools, public schools, that would turn the flag upside down or burn it. Is that kind of a resentment or reaction or to that or um, that you, mean to, to do to, uh, you mean to the loss of the territory? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that, All mm -hmm. right, but I do know that uh, one of the issues today is uh, is dealing with, you know, how the United States should be very separate from Mexico, right? 
uh, talk of the wall and so forth. But remember that uh, people were were migrating back and forth, you know, since uh, probably early 1500s, you know, from from what is now Mexico into what is now the United States. So they were crossing back and forth, you know, since that time. So uh, I, I think I think that may be a little. I've never bit heard of that, that aspect. Know? Mm -hmm. Because there was so much noise, mm -hmm. political noise, mm -hmm. over what was developing, and people got involved on both sides of the equation, the debate, and we never heard anything but fluff. But it never occurred to me that uh, people uh, had been for years transferring back and across that boundary without impediments. Without any, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so in that process too, what, what we, what, how we can tie this to uh, Cinco de Mayo is, is a lot of vocabulary uh, because because of that territory, the history of that territory being tied to Spain and then to Mexico. Sure, I mean, there's there's uh, there's many states in the United States that are named that have Spanish names, right? California is one, right? Arizona. If we didn't name them that, yeah. the English and the French would have come up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, they were, yeah. Take them back to territory. Many of those were already had the name, and the, sure. the, the, the most obvious is uh, Nuevo Mexico, okay, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Not to mention all the cities and major cities in the Southwest, San Francisco, you know, San Antonio, San mm -hmm. Jose, you know, all those are Spanish names, you know. Oh, okay, tell me, um, where could we go uh, around uh, Flint or Sano you know, and find the celebration of Cinco de Mayo? And why should we come? Oh, okay, well, well number, number one is, the, the reason you should come is because I mentioned before, you know, is the food, you know. It's always great to eat uh, terrific ethnic food. It's always great to... You're making me hungry. <laughs> It's always great. To, well, you can dance afterwards. <laughs> always great to listen to music and dance, and all those elements uh, that I mentioned in art. You know, they they also are a mix of of, of different cultures. You know, uh, for example, with the music, uh, uh, you know, the the Germans uh, uh, were very much into what is now Texas. You know, before when it was still Mexico, right? So they brought over their instruments, and one instrument that they used was the button accordion. The uh, Mexicans in Texas, ad you know, adopted that and used that in their music. Uh, when we talk about foods, it's a mixture of different cultures. Uh, the corn tortilla was very much a, uh, a native Indian uh, food, you know. And then with the... Uh, with the Germans, uh, uh, the uh, people in in what is now Texas, you know, used to be Mexico, but those people adapted to and used uh, the flour, the wheat flour. So and then they started to make their tortillas from uh, from wheat flour, mm -hmm. uh, and we see that in other aspects of the food. We see that in in the art. It's, it's a combination of uh, different elements. So. Bob, uh, while I'm thinking about it, explain to me, now Mexicans have a unique musical style, taste and tone, that practically everybody loves, and they have great dances. But can you explain to me why in some that Mexicans are fascinated with, uh, with the uh, instruments from Ireland? And Scotland, mm -hmm. because sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference in the mm -hmm. certain segments of the music yeah. when they're playing. Why are they well, fascinated? Well, well, like all like all cultures, all right. They 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 borrow, so to speak, or they utilize uh, from other cultures. So, so one one very popular music uh, with some people from Mexico is the mariachi music, and that's very much European. Violins, trumpets, guitars, but they uh, they added some of their own instruments. They they have a guitarron, which is a bass. You play this way instead of an upright. You know, 
That was one of their instruments. Uh, uh, bringing in the accordion to to another style of, of, uh, of music. Uh, so uh, music out of Mexico and the influence that came out of there has developed many, many, many styles. Right? But it's unique from the United States. If you look at cultures in the United States, uh, say for example, the uh, um, black American culture, they don't use necessarily a large um, combination of the same. Well, th there's la Latino jazz that's been around yeah. many, many, many years, all right? So that's the influence that's the influence from the, from the black culture, mm -hmm. you know, from the jazz mu musicians from the U.S. and that and then that, that that blended in with with the rhythms from from Latin America. So it I produced produced uh, a, a, a very unique style of music. So. I was basically referring to the accordion. Oh, the accordion, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. see, yeah. The, mm -hmm. and that music is so pretty. Yeah, when they introduced the yeah. Music. When you listen to it, when you listen to accordion music, uh, that's. Uh, some people refer to it as Latino music or Tejano music. You know, it's very much influenced by the Europeans, by the Germans, the Polish. You know, they use that instrument uh, in, in their music and still do today. You know. uh, I cannot imagine people never doing the cha cha cha. <laughs> uh, that's typically mm -hmm. Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very well loved mm -hmm. among Black Americans and everybody else. Um, Explain. Why did that take on uh, so rapidly and uh, endure so long? Yeah, I don't know if you know this or not, but most dances come up from the lower mm -hmm. part of society, and then they they move up, mm -hmm. and then they're accepted by the upper yeah. class. You know, and claimed. Yeah. So uh, it, it's just uh, you. Uh, I don't think you can escape how music moves you. Right? It makes you move. You know. That's fun, you know, and then you can dance, you know, and have a good time. So, music, uh, dancing is an excellent way to to get to know a particular culture, you know, and then every culture has a mixture of of elements from other groups that that come into the music, that come into the art, that come into the food. Uh, and so forth. So you know, I, I I've never seen anybody complain against the uh, Mexican move m music. It is very well accepted in all the cultures, and everybody like to dance to it. And I've seen elements of other cultures uh, flow into the Mexican as well, mm -hmm. or the music, yeah. and well, like you say it. Yeah, I mean, even today, you know, with the hip hop and other mm -hmm. uh, styles of popular music for the kids, you know, uh, you you can hear that in Spanish too. You know, so. Yes. It's very popular. Uh, okay. Um, well, um, Robert, you know, uh, we've got to bring the show to a close. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really enjoyed you today. And uh, you've brought to us uh, a great conversation yeah. about why, through culture, we need to combine our sentiments together mm -hmm. uh, in North America. Yeah. Uh, and so here's a little, just a little thing for the teachers out there. You know, uh, they can they can view that video and and get ideas of what what they can do in their classroom. You know, language, especially if they're teaching Spanish, right? Uh, the the music, the dancing, and so forth. Uh, they can bring all that in the history. You know, so into their classrooms, and they can their their students can learn something from it. From that. my research and in your conversation today, and I hope all of our audience out there. Uh, we get the same sentiment that I did. We've appreciated you. Mm -hmm. We uh, love you, and we hope that uh, things will settle down for that part of the world. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a time that uh, the In My Opinion show must come to a close. And till then, stay focused.